confer with Communist Party Chairman Hua Guofeng, who went to France last year, and with Vice Chairman Deng Xiaoping. On Sunday, he will travel to Tibet for what is expected to be a private visit. He will be the first foreign leader to go there. The crucial element of his stay in China will, of course, be his talks with Chinese leaders. They are expected to focus on European security, Western unity, and the Soviet global challenge. China was disturbed by President Giscard's summit meeting with Soviet President Brezhnev earlier this year. It has also been concerned that independent French policies might possibly benefit the Soviet Union. But in a report from Paris, the Chinese news agency says a growing number of people in France realize that only when France strengthens its cooperation with its allies can it deal successfully with what it calls the coming menaces. At the same time, the Chinese Communist Party newspaper People's Daily has alluded favorably to French opposition to what the newspaper calls superpower monopoly of international affairs. The newspaper adds that French demands for a Soviet military withdrawal from Afghanistan and for a Vietnamese withdrawal from Kampuchea are, in its words, positive contributions to world peace and stability. Still, Chinese leaders are expected to pursue one dominant theme in their talks with President Giscard, the need, as they see it, for the Western alliance with French cooperation to respond more effectively to Soviet expansionism. This is Wayne Corey, VOA, Hong Kong. China has officially protested to the United States over the granting of privileges normally reserved for diplomats to representatives of Taiwan. China's official Xinhua News Agency says Vice Foreign Minister Zhang Wenjin summoned U.S. Ambassador Leonard Woodcock to the Foreign Ministry today to present an official protest note. Economist Lawrence Klein today won the Nobel Prize for Economics, becoming the eighth American to win a Nobel Award this year. Saying it's always nice to be recognized for your work, Mr. Klein told VOA he was pleased with the announcement from the Royal Swedish Academy. The Academy cited the University of Pennsylvania professor for his work in building economic models that have helped the analysis of economic growth and policy. Mr. Klein has been a leading research worker in the field of econometric models, which use mathematical and statistical methods to test economic theories and forecast economic trends. In East Africa, the invasion of Northwest Uganda seems to have ended, but it is hard to know for certain. Correspondent Sean Kelly explains. Reports reaching Kampala Wednesday said that most of the invading soldiers have retreated back across the border into neighboring Sudan and Zaire. Ugandan head of state, Paolo Mwanga, announced earlier that their advance into Uganda had been halted, but in a nationwide address Tuesday, he gave no specific details as to the fighting. He also avoided any mention of those border towns reported to have been captured by the invading troops last week. So it is a little difficult to know exactly what is happening in northwestern Uganda. Reporters have not been allowed near the area, and many Ugandans feel that the government statements about the level of fighting have been greatly exaggerated. The troops themselves are said to be former supporters of Ugandan dictator Idi Amin, who was overthrown last year. In their retreat from Uganda, several thousand of the soldiers slipped over the border into Sudan and Zaire. Many of them were from the border area anyway. In fact, some reports from Uganda describe the invasion as simply an effort on the part of the ex-Amin soldiers to get back home. They were said to have been welcomed in some of the villages on the Ugandan side of the border. Charges by the Ugandan government that the invasion had been backed by Sudan and Zaire with money from Saudi Arabia have all been firmly rejected by the countries involved. In the meantime, Mr. Mwanga says that the situation is well under control, although he warned Ugandans against collaborating with what he called subversive elements. Part of the difficulty is that Uganda is now preparing for its first national elections in 18 years. And there are some political advantages to be gained by creating an atmosphere of crisis in the country. The elections have already been postponed once in recent days, and in his Tuesday address, Mr. Mwanga extended the registration deadline for all voters by one week and suggested...
suggested that there might be further extensions in those areas of the country affected by the current fighting. Sean Kelly, Voice of America, East Africa Bureau. Tight security was evident in Colombo today as the Sri Lanka government prepared for tomorrow's parliamentary debate on a motion to deprive former Prime Minister Sri Mavo Bandaranaika of her civil rights. Troops and police have surrounded key installations, but the government has not yet implemented Tuesday's decision to invoke a state of emergency in response to threats of violence from Mrs. Bandaranaika's supporters. The parliament, parliamentary motion, rather, is based on the recommendation of a special presidential commission which accused the former prime minister and her nephew of abuse of power during her term in office. In South Africa, the main rail line between Johannesburg and the black township of Soweto was blown up by saboteurs in a day of demonstrations against rent increases in the township. Margaret Kennedy has details. The two explosions near the busy Dubai railway station in Soweto came just before 4 a.m. One of the four rail lines into the city was cut and the signal system for the entire system was damaged so that rail service for early morning commuters was several hours late. But it is not clear how many actually went to work. There is no question the incident was sabotage. Police said they found and defused eight more explosive charges on the tracks. The explosions came only hours after a meeting of Soweto residents called on all black workers to stay home today to protest the visit to Soweto this afternoon by the Minister of Black Affairs, Pete Cornhoff. He is to be made an honorary citizen of Soweto by the government-sponsored Soweto Council. Dr. Kornhoff says he intends to go ahead with the visit, even though Soweto has been the scene of demonstrations throughout the day. Riot police using tear gas and dogs dispersed hundreds of people who gathered at the Soweto Council chambers in anticipation of the arrival of Dr. Kornhoff. Fifteen people were arrested and two policemen were injured in clashes between demonstrators and police. At one point, the chairman of the Soweto Committee of Ten, Dr. Intato Matlana, made a brief appearance to the cheers of the crowd. Earlier, there were a number of rock-throwing incidents involving buses and taxis trying to take commuters to work. All shops and banks in the township are closed. The call for the boycott of work began a few days ago when the Women's Federation of South Africa decided it had to continue the protest against rent increases in Soweto. Rents are being increased in steps so that by early next year, they will be doubled. This is Margaret Kennedy, Voice of America in Johannesburg. In Algeria, the situation of the persons left homeless by last week's devastating earthquake is desperate. We have a report from CBS correspondent Robin Wright. Officials say there are at least 150,000 homeless in the area around al Hasnam. Most are now cramped into tents or living in makeshift shanties. There is no running water, electricity, or regular food sources. All has to be brought in from Algiers. The American Emergency Aid Team today met with Algerian officials to discuss further U.S. aid, such as latrines and prefabricated housing. A 40-man American disaster relief team is now in the area, devastated by a series of earthquakes last Friday. They are evaluating the damage and helping with the injured. The U.S. aid is among the largest. So far, the Soviet Union, one of Algeria's closest allies, has not flown in emergency supplies. And there is growing curiosity among diplomats about the noticeable lack of Eastern Bloc help. Robin Wright, CBS News, Algiers. On the American political scene, President Carter campaigns in the industrial northeast today, stopping first in Boston to address a senior citizens group and a Democratic Party fundraising luncheon. Later on, the president stops in the economically depressed coal mining areas of northeastern Pennsylvania and the industrial sections of northern New Jersey. Mr. Carter's former rival for the Democratic nomination, Senator Edward Kennedy, will join the president in Massachusetts and New Jersey. The tour, combined with scheduled stops in Connecticut and New York tomorrow, shows that the president is focusing on an area where the polls show him almost even with his Republican rival, Ronald Reagan. 
Mr. Reagan is campaigning in Ohio and Michigan today, while independent candidate John Anderson is in Wisconsin and the northwestern state of Washington. The issues in this year's presidential election will be discussed about a minute from now on the VOA program Dateline, which you can hear on many of these frequencies as a group of journalists talk to a noted political scientist about what is going on in the election campaign. That's on Dateline about a minute from now at 1730 GMT. But first, here's another look at the hour's major news developments. Iranian jets bomb Baghdad for the second straight day as Iraqi troops continue their advance on the Iranian refinery center of Abadan. Delegates from Israel, Egypt, and the United States continue their discussions in Washington on Palestinian autonomy. Soviet and American officials gather in Geneva for preliminary talks on limiting nuclear missiles in Europe. Those are the headlines, and that's the news this hour. I'm Alan Silverman on The Voice of America. We are now going off 1197 kilohertz medium wave and 3980 kilohertz short wave. However, Voice of America listeners in Europe may continue listening on the following short wave frequencies. 9760, 11760, or 15205 kilohertz. The Voice of America presents Dateline. We are now going off 1575 kilohertz medium wave. However, Voice of America listeners in South Asia may continue listening on the following shortwave frequencies. 6110, 7105, 9670, 9700, 9760, 15205, 15260, or 15395 kilohertz. This program has come to you from the United States of America.